everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Being a Lineman. Today we're going to be covering an extremely common call, at least in, in the area that I work here, and that's an arcing tap clamp. This here is what we refer to as a tap clamp. The wire goes into here. It'll fit up to 4 aught copper. Mind you, the 4 aught gets pretty tight once it's in there. Ideally, 1 aught or smaller. And uh, we stick our grab ball over top of this guy. You can spin that with the fiberglass grab ball. You can see right here as that connection opens up. That goes on to what we call a stirrup, which is this guy. Pretty self-explanatory as to why it's called a stirrup. Now this guy here goes onto the wire. It's got a whole bunch of Penetrox gunk in there. It makes a little bit better of a connection where there's more of a surface area and you can generally tighten it up as much as you can on that wire and not worry about having to remove it again. Whereas this guy is more designed to come off and on as needed if you got to do work on a transformer or if you're using it for protection, you're working down the line, you want an actual air gap between the main phase and the sideline, the uh, connection that's feeding the sideline that you're working on. So we're going to change this transformer. Now, huge, huge hazard here that would have been easy to miss. You see that lightning arrestor right in the center of the screen? It's actually completely broke off that bracket. It's kind of hard to tell from here. You can see it's a little lopsided. But uh, the fuse is blown. Our next step would be to remove that tap clamp before we change that transformer. We're actually going to change the switch, lightning arrestor, and transformer. But now, well, trying to get that tap clamp off, it's gonna be shaking that pole around a good chance that lightning rester might fall off so what we're gonna be doing we got our hot light cutters here tested and uh, we're gonna just snip that clear first thing and we'll put a new lead on so generally speaking when we get these calls it comes in as transformers humming or someone sees a bright light on the transformer or transformers arcing it's, it's never really the transformer. It's usually that connection right there. So this particular call the other day was actually uh, a member of the community that works for the town that called me direct and said, you know, there's, there's buzzing this bright light coming from a transformer. It's not a real serious call. However, it can arc enough that you can get some, some metal heat up and drop. I'll see if I got, I got a picture of a tap clamp that actually started melting. That was kind of neat. Made like an icicle out of metal on it. I'll see if I can't dig that up when I get home. But generally speaking, it's, it's not a real dangerous situation. Usually what happens, it starts arcing until it burns the lead off or, or breaks the connection. Sometimes the lead will actually drop right off. Um, it might arc a little bit if there's a lot of load on it. The customers will experience some flickering lights. It's something that needs to be repaired. As soon as possible however it would definitely not take precedence over a, a wires down call for example yeah uh, 804 so 11 pole 198 uh, when you get there you can go ahead and open 804 so 11 and report 10 for you said whenever i get there i can go ahead and open 804 so 11 and report and for I'll just wait for the fire trucks here, and as soon as they arrive, I'll get them to block the road, and I'll head down and dump the line and report back. So this particular night here, it was raining quite hard. Oh. Oh. Uh, the guy was up in the air. Uh, one of my partners was up in the air, up and down pretty quick. We we're getting soaked out there. So the first step in responding to an arcing tap clamp call. Uh, of course, is our tailboard. We go over the location we're at. 
there's two circumstances that you're going to run into. One is a tap clamp, which feeds a cutout feeding a transformer. And the other is a tap clamp, which feeds a cutout that feeds another sideline. We don't usually use the tap clamps on mainline connections. Ideally, anything over 100 amps, you want to have an ampack connection up there. It makes a lot better connection. We generally don't have any problems with the ampacks whatsoever as far as corrosion heating up. As that tap clamp connection goes bad, if the arcing causes any damage, it's going to damage the stirrup itself, at which point we can remove it and put a new one on, but it's not going to cause any actual damage to the wire. So we identify the, the type of job. If it is a tap clamp that's feeding a sideline in any way, shape or form, we have to advise our dispatcher and get a work permit on the line. And the work permit, it's, it basically tags the system so that anybody else in the area they know we're working on that line. But on the drive out here, there was actually a crew working on the lines. Now, if there was any trouble in this area at all, I'm supposed to be notified. For whatever reason, these guys were already out working on the line. I had no idea. And that's why you always tag your switches. Um, you never assume that just because you're the only one out in the area that no one's going to be coming along behind. So uh, I noticed uh, three switches open. There's a tag on the pole. It's kind of thinking, what is going on out here? And eventually I caught up to crew working as a phase down behind us. So we'll physically tag the poles in the field. The dispatcher will tag the switches in the system. That's a form of protection to make sure that everybody knows where we are and what we're doing. If we're changing the tap clamp and it's just on a transformer, we don't generally need a work permit for that. There are some situations with parallel transformers, uh, back feed, customer owned equipment, where it might get a little bit more complicated. For generally speaking, we just open the transformer. Now, one thing you do have to look out for in the transformer situation is back feed from the customers. Everyone's got a generator nowadays. So you can do one of two things because chances are you're gonna to be touching that lead coming out of the high side of the transformer. First thing you can do is remove all the meters so there's no back feed. That might be a pretty big pain in the butt if it's feeding 16 houses or something. So we actually have written into our procedures that we can check for potential and install grounds on the secondary bushings of the transformer. That way there's no way for that transformer to back feed primary voltage up into the lead that you're working on. So you got to follow the procedures for the company that you guys are working for. In order to stop that tap clamp from arcing, we got to remove the load. You remove the load by opening the cutout. There are some lines that the tap clamp's feeding a lead, feeding a side line where there is not a cutout right there. Uh, in those situations, you'll have to go down the line and open the transformers, pop the meters, breakers, whatever you gotta do. But before lifting that tap clamp, you gotta remove the load. In this particular case, on this night here, when removing the load, we were using what's called a load buster. This hooks onto the cutout, that goes at the top of the door, this guy hooks into the bottom, as you open it, there's a spring mechanism in there that quickly extinguishes that load. Um, I've actually got a video showing step-by-step -step how this guy functions, so check that out. I'll put a link in the comments. If it's only a 50 kVA transformer feeding three or four houses, grab your long stick, hook that in the cutout ring, yank her open. You're not gonna draw much of an arc. The actual procedure in our books is we're allowed to open a cutout without a load busting device as long as there's 10 amps or less on the cutout. Some cutouts even have an arc chute built right in that is good for 200 amps, I believe is the interrupting low current rated on that arc chute. Don't quote me on that, I'm gonna have to check that one out. Actually, if anyone knows for sure on a 200 amp cutout, how much that arc chute's actually rated for, let me know in the comments. All right, so we got the load off. Now we remove the top clamp. This part's usually pretty easy. We grab our grab ball. Some guys call it a shotgun. Um, it's your insulated stick. It fits over this guy right here. You start loosening it off and using the insulated stick, you remove the top clamp.
Now here's the problem. This guy's arcing, a lot of heat, burning metal, bad connection. It might be seized on. In fact, it might be seized on or it might fall right off. So you gotta keep your eye on that lead. When you go to put your grab ball on that, that lead could fall right off the line. Most times when it falls off the line, it's gonna fall off the line isolated. So it's not a real dangerous situation if, uh, if the cutout's being backfed up through the bottom side, which you will encounter in the field. We're talking a whole different story. So you'll have to be, you'll have to be aware of that situation. If it is seized on, we've actually got insulated bolt cutters. I got to set on my truck on a six foot long fiberglass stick. I'm going to cut that as close to that tap clamp as possible. Again, the load's already been removed. So that lead, once I cut it, usually it stays in the jaws of the cutters, but if it doesn't, it falls down away from the lines. You're good to go. So next thing is the clearance while you're working. We, we keep our cutouts far enough away from the primary, like put your 20 KV gloves on and you simply change the tap clamp. Back it up, forgot to mention a step. If you're on a transformer, that's fine. Once you go through all that secondary back feed stuff. If you're on another high voltage sideline, uh, spur line, we call them a sideline, radial line, you're gonna need to ground that radial line. It's much in the way of the transformer thing. It protects you from the back feed, however, because there's a primary span that it's feeding, there, there could be high voltage in that primary line. And if it's not grounded, you're not working on it. So our first step before grinding that, we get something like this. They come in all different shapes, sizes. It's a potential indicator. We turn this guy on, watch your ears. And you set it to your desired voltage. When you go up near the line, you can hear it's a beeping. That means it's uh, it's activated, the battery's good. Once it gets it within a proximity of the line that you're checking, it's gonna beep quite loudly and that red light's gonna flash. If that happens, you know you got voltage in that line. You're gonna have to stop and reassess. So what we're expecting is for that to do nothing, continue on beeping, at which point we're gonna install our ground on the primary. From the neutral up to the primary, along with any bonding required to work on that pole. Usually what I'll do in most cases, keep my 20 KV gloves on. The only thing I'm gonna actually handle is the top side lead of the cutout. We're going to back this nut off, pop it off the lead, put a new guy on, that's it. Pretty simple and easy job. Some situations where the cutout is extremely close to the primary, some older standards, older construction, you can install a hard cover up and cover up that primary. That way you get some extra protection um, while you're working, especially at night. You're gonna want to inspect also the condition of the stirrup while you're there. You wanna make sure it's gonna make a good connection. You can actually put a brush on the end of your uh, grab ball or your hot stick and give that a good brush before you put things back together. So you're up there working away, you got the top clamp changed, a brand new one installed. You will wanna make sure you remove all your grounds, um, grounds, bonds, anything that you put in place that made the work site safe. And from a safe distance away, part of your procedures may include talking to your dispatcher before you energize the cut over the sideline again. Using the grab ball, we're going to take that top clamp, flip it up, grab a hold of that primary wire again, Tighten that up real snug. A little tip, guys. As it's biting down, when you're tightening it, it's gonna tend to turn that tap clamp sideways. And when it actually starts to bite the wire, it's gonna wanna start climbing up the wire and bite it a little bit sideways like this. So once it's sitting on the wire, you can see the groove in the center. You're gonna see the wire kicked over to one side on this end, the other side on the back end. All you gotta do, Get that a little flick up and down and it'll kind of roll that tap clamp and wire right into place in the center. Flick it up and down a couple times. Once it's seated correctly, tighten it up. It starts to get stiff. Give it another flick. Keep tightening up again. Another flick. Tighten it up. Keep doing that till it's properly seated, properly tightened. Pretty much as tight as you can get it with the grab ball is, is tight enough.
uh, sometimes when you're building the line, you might put these on by hand. If the line's dead, grounded, you're leather gloving, new construction, and guys will take a screwdriver, put the screwdriver in there and start really coming onto it. If you tighten that up with a screwdriver, there's going to be no way that someone will ever get that off again with the grab ball, or you don't have as much leverage on the actual ring as you're loosening it off. So if you are going to use a screwdriver to tighten that up, it only has to be snug. It might be a good idea to kind of practice, see how tight you get it, put a grab ball on it, make sure you can get it off, get used to how tight to actually put these things. There's nothing worse than you're working on a line, pouring rain outside, you put your grab ball on that tap clamp, and it's on there too tight and you can't get it off. Then you gotta take a permit on the line up top or use the bolt cutters and put a brand new lead. All right, so we got our new tap clamp, tap back on to the stirrup. Everything's ready to go. We've double checked that our grounds have been removed. Another extremely important step before energizing anything, high voltage, low voltage, whatever, is you let every single guy on the crew know that you're about to energize. So we call it an all clear. So I'll yell down to my partner, hey, Bob, you all clear? Yes, sir, we're all clear. Okay, we're going to energize. And you always use that three-way communication to make sure that they understand and repeat back what you're doing. So when I close cutouts in our particular company, we use a two-piece stick, an A-B stick, or you can use your extendo stick. That way you get a good safe distance from that cutout in case the fuse blows or something goes wrong. It's not fun being close to that. It's loud throw trap null um, just not a good scene I'm sure you guys have seen that in videos online before so you grab your AB stick you move a safe distance away from that cutout you line that door up bringing it about almost halfway shut you don't want to do one full sweeping motion as you close it because that way the door might not line up 100% with the hood and spring on top so you're gonna lift the door up get it in the closed position a good practice is to actually look away from the cutout as you're closing. That way, if it does blow, it doesn't blind you. Safety glasses or not, it might protect you physically, but man, that flash is bright. You don't want to be looking at it if there's an error. So we're going to look away and click, lines energized, on to the next one. All right, guys, so that's all we got for today. Pretty crazy, actually. This rain, this is December. It's uh, December 2020 right now. This footage is all from within the last few days. And we've gotten like over 150 millimeters worth of rain. It's just crazy, especially for December. Normally, we'd be getting snow right now. So not going to lie, it'd be kind of cool to get about six feet of snow. I've got an old sled at home. It's fun, gives us something to do in the cold. Right now, it's just kind of wet, cold and miserable out there. One of the most common questions or comments in the threads in the comment section is, where did I get the name Bob's Decline? What does it mean? I've answered it a few times. If you want to dig through the comments, I did explain generally where, how I come up with that. Unfortunately, and I hate to disappoint you guys, it's not really that exciting of a story. It's, it's more or less just my username I used ever since high school. But there is a bit of a story as to how I got it. I am going to give you guys the whole story pretty soon. Um, I think I'm going to do an episode just something along the lines of who is Bob's Decline and give you guys a little bit more about myself. So any questions you guys have, again, in the comments, we'll try to cover that in that video. Make sure you consider subscribing. Drop me a fist bump. Let me know where you're watching from. And we'll see you next time.